this working okay? Can you hear me all right? Well, thank you very much, Julia, and thank you very much, Matt. We're delighted that you're able to join us, and it's great to be able to send a message to everyone here that the work that we do doesn't just stop at the publication of Plant Atlas. It, it genuinely makes a difference. It influences policy, um, and that's fantastic to hear and see it in action, hopefully next year with the Nature Environment Bill. Uh, okay, so um, I'm Matt, the new BSBI Scotland officer. Um, my first year in the job has simply flown by. And I'm so grateful to BSBI, RBG, and the Scottish botanical community at large uh, for welcoming me with open arms. It's been an absolutely wonderful year. Um, it's been a year full of fabulous places, fantastic people, great company, amazing plants, and sometimes even if the conditions have left a little bit to be desired it's been a blast so that's me and i'm here to talk about plant atlas in scotland what makes scotland's flora so special we all know it's special it supports a unique collection of important habitats many of which are nationally and internationally important for conservation scotland supports 79 percent of britain's native flora including global endemics not found anywhere else, like one of all our favourites, I expect, the Scottish primrose. And another thing that makes Scotland's flora so special is that some of our native plants are present here at the very edges of their ranges. We have uh, several species on the slide here, diapensia, oyster plant, um, northern marsh orchid, Scottish eyebright and uh, russet sedge that are here at their southern uh, limit of their range. Um, and there would be more, uh, except for those great big mountains uh, in the south of Europe, where Arctic alpines are also found. So on to Plant Atlas 2020. It had two key aims. Firstly, to map the distribution of all flowering plants and ferns growing in the wild in Britain and Ireland at a 10 kilometre grid square resolution. Secondly, to measure the changes in their distribution over the last 70 years since the BSBI's first atlas was published. Trends were effort adjusted and estimated across both the long and the short term. In Scotland, the work for Plant Atlas 2020 involved over 450 recorders, making over 3 million plant records of 2,500 species plus Quite frankly, an amazing effort given the remote nature of much of our country. Um, so a huge thank you to all of the botanists here who were involved, particularly the Vice County Recorders, who drove the project through in the field over the 20 year period. So what did we learn about the changes to Scotland's flora? 47% of our native plant species have declined since the 1950s. And for ancient introductions or archaeophytes as they're known, that figure rises to 66%, which is the highest proportion of any of the countries covered by the plant atlas. In contrast, neophytes or recent introductions have increased by nearly two thirds. This graph shows the smooth trends for each of these groups in Scotland since the 1950s, with native species shown in purple in steady decline. Uh, neophytes steadily increasing, and the archaeophytes showing a much more pronounced decline over the monitoring period. We can also examine Scottish flora by habitat, where species associated with each, uh, with each of the main habitat types here in Scotland have been grouped together to allow the overall trend in their relative frequency to be identified. As you might expect, the arable species, such as corn marigold shown here, have declined significantly. But for broadleaf woodland in red and linear features such as hedgerows in grey, uh, the trends are much more stable. And this is despite a range of increasing threats to our native woodlands, such as increased grazing pressure, and perhaps shows that changing condition isn't something that is properly captured by 10 kilometer square frequency mapping. A coniferous woodland here in green. Uh, it's obviously increasing, and that's been driven by planting for commercial forestry uh, since the 1950s. The picture 
for species associated with bog and montane habitats is one of more recent declines across the species groups in, in both habitats. Uh, for heath plants, slightly different story. They appear to have stabilized after historic declines, but the variation between species in this group is much broader, and that's shown by the broader purple bar on the graph. Uh, acid and calcareous plants, grassland plants, have also suffered consistent declines. Uh, these are the lower two lines on the graph, with even widespread species such as heath bedstraw, sheep sorrel, showing strong declines due to habitat loss in the lowlands and upland fringes and changing to grazing regimes. In England, a recent study documented or demonstrated that half of all semi-natural grasslands had been lost over the last half century. And there is no comparable study for Scotland, but clearly habitat loss has impacted our grassland species, such as harebell, uh, which itself has undergone moderate to strong long-term declines. Uh, interestingly, neutral grassland species appear to have suffered to a slightly lesser extent, possibly because fewer species are solely restricted to those habitats. And the creation of wildflower meadows may also have played a part in the recent trend stabilisation. A Plant Atlas 2020 has also revealed some very interesting stories at the species level. Two native species bucking the trend and increasing their ranges into Scotland as a result of climate change are bee orchid and mossy stone crop, shown here. So here we see the expanding range of bee orchid from 1930, the top left, to the present day, top right. And going through each date class, you can see how its distribution changes over time, but it finally reaching central Scotland and Kintyre uh, in the last 20 years. And new sites for this species uh, continue to be found. And if you go into the exhibition hall, you'll find uh, a display on the first bee orchids to be found in Midlothian uh, this year. Mossy stone crop uh, was restricted to South and East England. Uh, until 1930, when it appeared in northeast Scotland. Didn't do anything for a long time, and then in the last 20 years, it suddenly underwent a dramatic expansion uh, as a result of milder winter weather combined with accidental transport of seeds uh, and plant fragments and footprints and vehicles. The trend bars there on the right illustrate the, uh, the long and short term changes showing us how strong and positive an increase they have had. Click has stopped working. Okay. Everything stopped working. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. So another feature of the online plant atlas is change mapping, which allows you to show gains and losses for each species over time. And here we have two uh, non-native species that have greatly expanded their range, uh, shown by the red triangles on the map, each representing a 10 kilometer square area where um, the species has uh, increased in its range. Firstly, we have New Zealand pygmy, pygmy weed, which is an invasive aquatic um, that uh, has rapidly expanded over the last 70 years and has now even reached Orkney and Shetland. There we go. Uh, and on the right, we have Sitka spruce, familiar to everyone, which has increased in range the most out of all the species covered in the plant atlas. Um, it's an important commercial forestry tree, and much of the gains are the result of planting for timber. But as we all know, it's incredibly well adapted to our damp climate and peaty soils. Uh, so freely seeds into habitats adjacent to plantations such as heathland and blanket bog. Returning to the archaeophytes, um, as I said, two thirds of Scotland's archaeophytes have declined. And a really interesting example is the core marigold, now often encountered in sown wildflower beds in urban areas. It's traditionally an arable weed species, and it's strongly declined in Scotland due to arable intensification. And in the west of Scotland, 
the loss of small scale arable cropping with the abandonment of crofting. And the distribution map shown here shows how it's disappeared from much of the Hebrides and Western Scotland. Uh, each grey circle you can see there represents a 10 kilometer square where it's not been seen since 1986. Uh, another arable weed, the red dead nettle, has shown similar strong declines across Scotland. Uh, this species flowers almost all year round. It's colonised urban areas, making it a really important food source for pollinators. So it's concerning to see this decline. So for nearly half our native plant species, the story is one of decline. Habitat loss and degradation have impacted globe flower, one of my favourite plants. Uh, causing moderate long term declines and stronger recent declines as a result of draining of wet pastures, meadow improvement through fertilisation and reseeding uh, and overgrazing, particularly in upland areas where often this plant is now restricted to inaccessible ledges. Mountain everlasting, a species of unimproved grasslands with low fertility, has declined through habitat loss and also as a result of increasing uh, atmospheric nitrogen de uh, deposition, which benefits its competitors. Montane willow scrub, consisting of species such as this wonderful woolly willow, is an entire habitat under threat from grazing, with populations of willows becoming fragmented and restricted to ledges. A conservation work has shown by conservation work by the National Trust of Scotland on Ben Laws and in Cairngorms has shown that you by fencing and reducing grazing pressure, along with careful boosting of populations by translocations, that these scrub species can make a comeback. The beautiful alpine gentian shown here is known in Britain from just two areas in central Scotland, in central highlands, and its relationship to grazing is more complex. High levels of sheep grazing cause high mortality, but also open up the grassland, so creating bare patches where the gentian seed, seedlings can establish. Now, the impact of climate change can be particularly damaging for our high altitude snowbed specialists, such as snow pearlwort, shown here, a beautiful photo from Sarah, thank you, and alpine lady fern. These species rely on late lying snow to reduce competition from other plants, so as less snow falls, and the snow patches melt earlier in the season, they're starting to struggle. The snow pearlwort is a very rare snowbed species with nearly the entire British population present on Ben Laws. And assessing this species at the 10 kilometer square level, as we've done for Plant Atlas, uh, suggests it's fairly stable, but it's not giving the whole picture. So if you look at the map here, you'll see the rapid rate of recent population loss. Every blue dot on the map represents a loss of a population over the last 40 years. And those few green dots represent the final colonies hanging on. So Plant Atlas 2020 also gave us some additions to our native flora. Salt marsh sedge, uh, a shy flower. Flower was discovered for the first time in 2004. Nordic moonwort, which was identified through genetic studies was discovered uh, in Glen Shee in 2017 and has since been found near Ben Laws as well. And the new monkey flower, uh, the result of the hybridization of two of the uh, naturalized monkey flowers, was also discovered for, for the first time globally in South Lanarkshire and then again in Orkney. Sorry. The intensive fieldwork for Plant Atlas 2020 also changed our understanding of the distribution of some native species in a positive way. And Alpine bearberry is an excellent example of this. It was found in new locations due to the more intensive recording in remote parts of northern Scotland. Um, as a result, it's now no longer assessed as nationally scarce. The plant atlas data has already been used to revise our nationally scarce and nationally rare lists. And it's also informing a comprehensive update of the Great Britain Red List due for publication in 2025. So what next for Scotland's flora? Well, Plant Atlas 2020 is an incredibly powerful tool for policymakers, conservationists, as they seek to protect our wild plants, the habitats they live in and the wildlife they support. We need to use it 
and the data that underpin it to help strengthen protection for our threatened plants by safeguarding the best remaining sites and managing them effectively. We need to restore our compromised habitats, such as peat bogs and native woodlands, and ensure that areas of high quality habitat are linked together in the landscape. We need to manage our land, water and soils more sustainably for plants, moving away from unsustainable farming practices and land management that promotes high densities of livestock and deer in the highlands. We need to put plants at the heart of our conservation initiatives. As other wildlife depends on them for food and shelter, and so in doing so, we ensure gains in overall biodiversity. We need to engage in the effective long term monitoring of plants that can deliver reliable data that answers clear policy and research questions. And finally, we need to tackle plant blindness, where despite their importance to us, plants are often overlooked and undervalued. And that's why it's so heartening to see the State of Nature report taking the plant atlas trends and data and putting it at the heart of uh, our future environmental policy. So I'd like to thank all of our members and supporters in Scotland, without whom plant atlas simply could not have been undertaken, especially the Vice County Recorder Network that forms the backbone of the BSBI here. So thank you. I'd also like to thank RBGE for their fantastic support here of BSBI in Scotland and Nature Scott, without whose continuing support, we could not carry out this vitally important work for Scotland's flora. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, we're running slightly behind, so I'm going to take questions from Matt and um, Aline together, um, if that's OK. So could you store, remember your questions, hold them and we we'll, we'll do them afterwards. Um, so um, I want to, I'm delighted to introduce Aline Finger, who's a molecular ecologist here at um, the Botanics, specialising in conservation and ec ecological genetics of threatened and important plant species to help their protection and to inform conservation and management decisions. So Aline's going to talk about how her genetic work can inform and maximise the success of conservation translocations and can support Scottish plant recovery. I hope this is working and I've been